Pop mogul Marion Sherg Knight is headed back to prison. Today, a Los Angeles judge sentenced the 53-year-old co-founder of Death Row Records to 28 years in jail after Knight pleaded no contest to killing one man and injuring another when he ran over them in 2015. In the world of hip-hop, few names carry as much weight and controversy as Marion Suge Knight. From his humble beginnings to his meteoric rise as a music industry powerhouse, Knight's journey has been nothing short of extraordinary. But with success came a dark side, leading to a series of events that ultimately landed him behind bars. Today, we will explore Suge's disturbing message from jail. Suge Opens Podcast. Born on April 19, 1965 in Compton, California, Suge Knight grew up in a world where the streets shaped his character and ambition. As a former football player, Knight possessed a relentless drive that would later propel him to the forefront of the music industry. In the late 1980s, he co-founded the legendary Death Row Records, a label that would forever change the landscape of hip-hop. Under Knight's leadership, Death Row Records became a powerhouse, signing some of the biggest names in the industry, including Dr. Dre, Snoop Dogg, and the late Tupac Shakur. The label's gritty and unapologetic apologetic sound resonated with audiences worldwide, catapulting it to the top of the charts and solidifying its place in music history. However, with success came a darker side. Knight's reputation for intimidation and violence became synonymous with his name, earning him a fearsome reputation within the industry. His involvement in various controversies and legal battles only added to the mystique surrounding his persona. But it was a fateful night in 1996 that would forever change the course of Knight's life and the hip-hop world. The tragic murder of Tupac Shakur sent shockwaves through the industry, and Knight found himself entangled in the aftermath. The incident marked a turning point, leading to a series of legal troubles that would eventually lead to his incarceration. Fast forward to the present day, and Suge Knight finds himself serving time behind bars, with his freedom not expected until October 2034. However, even from prison, Knight refuses to be silenced. In a shocking turn of events, he has teamed up with David Mays to launch a podcast titled Collect Call with Suge Knight. According to TMZ, Knight and his collaborator David Mays already recorded five 30-minute episodes before they were scheduled to release on October 31st last year, and now they have over 12 episodes. This highly anticipated podcast will be available in both audio and video formats, providing fans with a unique opportunity to hear directly from Knight himself. So what can listeners expect from Collect Call with Suge Knight? Well, one thing is for certain. Knight plans to address some of the artists and hip-hop moguls he has had issues with over the years. Master P, WAC 100, Warren G, Dr. Dre, and Akon are just a few of the names that Knight intends to confront head on. But it doesn't stop there. Collect Call promises to be more than just a platform for airing grievances. Knight also aims to delve further into his thoughts on Snoop Dogg, now owning the Death Row brand. This revelation has left fans wondering what Knight truly thinks about the direction his once thriving label has taken. To give you a taste of what's to come, a trailer for the podcast has been released. In it, Suge Knight can be heard addressing Warren G's comments on Drink Chat earlier this year. Knight questions Warren G's ability to free Tupac Shakur from prison, sparking intrigue and anticipation among listeners. David Mays, the CEO of Breakbeat Media, expressed his excitement about the podcast, stating that it will provide a truthful and authentic perspective on the important happenings in the hip-hop world. As the 50th year of hip-hop is celebrated, Mays believes that Collect Call with Suge Knight will awaken hip-hop fans worldwide and bridge the gap between multiple generations. However, there is one topic that Knight has made it clear he will not address on the podcast. In a recent call with TMZ founder Harvey Levin, Knight expressed his surprise at the arrest of Dwayne Keffy D. Davis in connection with the 1996 murder of Tupac Shakur. Knight stated that he thought the day would never come and that he would refuse to testify against Keffy D if called upon to do so. With each passing day, the anticipation for Collect Call with Suge Knight continues to grow. Fans and critics alike are eager to hear Knight's unfiltered and uncensored perspective on the industry he once dominated. As the launch date approaches, the hip-hop community braces itself for the shockwaves that Knight's podcast is sure to create. In the latest podcast, Knight discusses a range of topics, from the Super Bowl to Taylor Swift. I know, Dave, you probably going to check out the Super Bowl because you're a, Sw a Swifty fan, Taylor Swift fan. And surprisingly, Chris Brown. He asserts that there's a glaring double standard in how people respond to abuse allegations against Chris Brown compared to Dr. Dre. He had a fight with one woman, or he beat up one woman, and they still cast stones at him. While Brown is shunned and blackballed, Dre is celebrated despite facing similar accusations. 
One example that Knight highlights is the Grammy's Dr. Dre Global Impact Award. He expresses his disbelief, stating, this man would get an award for beating up women. Knight does not condone Brown's actions in the highly publicized incident involving Rihanna in 2009, but he argues that the singer has been stripped of opportunities, denied performances, and withheld from winning awards, while Dre continues to receive recognition and praise. Knight emphasizes the inconsistency in the treatment of the two artists, stating, he beat up one woman and they still casting stones at him. They don't give him his cigar, you don't let him come perform Form, they don't let him pretty much win awards, but you can have an impact award for Andre. This perceived double standard is a point of contention for Knight, who believes that both artists should be held accountable for their actions in a fair and equal manner. Suge Knight's claim of a double standard is further fueled by his personal experiences with both Dr. Dre and Chris Brown. Knight has had a tumultuous history with both artists, which adds another layer of complexity to his perspective. In 2014, Knight filed a lawsuit against Chris Brown in relation to a nightclub shooting where Brown was performing. This incident further strained their already contentious relationship. Knight's legal battle with Brown showcases the animosity between the two, and it is clear that Knight holds a grudge against the singer. Witnesses reported that Chris and Suge appeared to be engaged in a casual and friendly conversation that lasted for a few minutes. The atmosphere seemed relaxed, with no signs of tension or animosity between the two. However, in a matter of seconds, chaos erupted. Shots rang out, shattering the party atmosphere. Panic and confusion filled the air as partygoers scrambled for safety. The music abruptly stopped, leaving everyone in shock. The sound of gunshots, initially mistaken for fireworks, quickly revealed the horrifying reality of the situation. It was like something out of a movie. One moment, everyone was having a great time, and the next, it was complete chaos. But Knight's issues with Dr. Dre run even deeper. During his trial for killing a man with his truck on the set of the movie Straight Outta Compton, Knight testified that he was told about Dre's alleged involvement in hiring a hitman to harm him. He even claimed to have seen canceled checks as evidence. Dre sends hitman. Shots were fired in the early hours of August. 24, 2014, at the infamous One Oak nightclub in Los Angeles. Suge Knight found himself caught in the crosshairs of a violent altercation. Shots rang out, chaos ensued, and Knight was left with multiple gunshot wounds. This incident would set off a chain of events that would ultimately lead to Knight's claims of mistreatment. Speculation ran rampant about who could be behind the attack and what the motive might be. As Knight fought for his life, investigators began their search for answers. A name started to circulate within the music industry. T-Money, an individual known to have ties to both Knight and Dr. Dre, allegedly confessed to being involved in the shooting. According to Knight's lawyer, Thaddeus Culpepper, T-Money claimed that he and a friend had been paid a staggering $50,000 by none other than Dr. Dre to carry out the hit on Knight. T-Money came forward and confessed that he and his associate were hired by Dr. Dre to kill Suge Knight. This shocking revelation raises serious questions about the motives behind the shooting and the subsequent investigation. If true, it would mean that one of the most influential figures in hip-hop had orchestrated a plot to eliminate his former business partner. But the shocking allegations didn't stop there. During Suge's murder trial, Culpepper also alleges that an off-duty sheriff's deputy was involved in the shooting at One Oak. According to Culpepper, this deputy was seen on video letting the gunmen into the nightclub and later assisting them in leaving the country at LAX airport. The implications of this alleged involvement are staggering. The connection between the shooting at One Oak and the subsequent murder charge against Knight became a focal point in his defense. Knight claimed that he was trying to flee from Terry Carter and CLE Sloan, two individuals he believed posed a threat to his life. He alleged that he accidentally ran them over while attempting to reach out to Dr. Dre on the set of the film Straight Outta Compton. Suge Knight's defense team argues that the shooting at One Oak was a direct result of his fear for his life. They claim that Knight was trying to escape from individuals he believed were connected to the music industry and posed a threat to him. In an attempt to halt any potential connection between the shooting and the murder charge, Knight's mail and phone privileges were abruptly halted. His lawyer Culpepper argues that this move is an attempt to suppress the truth and prevent Knight from presenting his side of the story. By cutting off Knight's communication with the outside world, they are trying to silence him and prevent any connection from being made between the shooting at One Oak and the subsequent events. This is a clear violation of his rights and a desperate attempt to cover up the truth. In response to the allegations made by Suge Knight's lawyer, Dr. Dre's attorneys have called the claims ridiculous and denied any involvement in the shooting at One Oak. They maintain that these allegations are nothing more than an attempt to tarnish Dr. Dre's reputation.
The battle lines were drawn with Knight's lawyer Thaddeus Culpepper, weaving a tapestry of lies and deceit allegedly perpetrated by Dr. Dre and the police department. But could any of these allegations be proven? And what evidence did Culpepper have to support his claims? According to him, he had in his possession videos that show an off-duty sheriff's deputy letting the gunmen into One Oak and accompanying them to their flight at LAX airport. These videos are crucial evidence that supports our claims of a cover-up and the involvement of law enforcement in this shocking incident. In the wake of the club shooting incident, Suge Knight decided to take legal action against Chris Brown and the owners of One Oak. Knight filed a lawsuit in Los Angeles Superior Court, seeking justice for the injuries he sustained and the negligence he believes contributed to the incident. The lawsuit alleges that Brown and One Oak failed to provide adequate security measures, allowing individuals with weapons, including firearms, to gain access to the event. Knight's legal team argues that the defendants should have been aware of the potential risks given the history of violence at events hosted by Brown. They claim that the defendants' negligence directly resulted in the gunshots fired that night, causing Knight to be shot and seriously injured. While the lawsuit does not specify the exact amount of money Knight is seeking, it does request a judgment that would hold the defendants responsible for covering his past and future medical expenses related to his injuries. Furthermore, Knight recently made headlines by claiming that he took the fall for Dr. Dre in a federal gun case, resulting in him serving time. This revelation adds another layer of complexity to Knight's perspective, as he believes that Dre's actions have gone unpunished while he has faced the consequences. Suge takes the fall for Dre. I get in the business manager number. The guy calls the business manager. The business manager wires the money for Dre some guns to the guy who was giving the guns. A year or two later, on my birthday, they arrested me. According to Suge, he had stopped Dre from facing serious legal consequences for his actions. He claimed that Dre had been involved in violent incidents, including beating up multiple individuals. Suge, being the loyal friend and business partner that he was, couldn't bear to see Dre's career and freedom jeopardized. It was the 1990s, a time when hip-hop was exploding onto the mainstream scene and Death Row Records was at the forefront of the West Coast rap movement. Suge Knight, the imposing figure behind the label, had built an empire with artists like Dr. Dre, Snoop Dogg, and Tupac Shakur. But behind the scenes, a web of secrets and sacrifices was being spun. One of the first attention-grabbing stories that Suge Knight revealed on his podcast, Collect Call with Suge Knight, was about the relationship between Tupac Shakur and Warren G. Warren had claimed that he played a role in getting Tupac out of prison. But Suge refuted the story, stating that the two never even liked each other. This revelation set the stage for the shocking events that would follow. In the second episode of the podcast, Suge once again took center stage, this time shedding light on the process of getting Tupac out of prison. But amidst the tales of Tupac's release, Suge dropped a bombshell. He had taken the fall for Dr. Dre on a gun charge. Suge revealed that he had provided Dre with the contact information for a business manager who would handle the purchase of guns. The business manager would then wire the money for the guns to a third party who would deliver them to Dre. It seemed like a simple transaction at the time, but little did Suge know that it would come back to haunt him. A year or two later on his birthday, Suge found himself in handcuffs. The federal authorities had arrested him on a gun charge that should have been Dre's responsibility. But instead of letting Dre face the consequences of his actions, Suge made a fate decision. He took the fall. I said, F it. could you get him probation? David Kenner said, probably not. He said, maybe. I said, tell you what, either try to get me probation or I got to do a year or two to better be in the studio working. Suge willingly sacrificed his own freedom to protect Dre and ensure that he could continue making music. It was a shocking act of loyalty and sacrifice that few could have expected from the imposing figure of Suge Knight. But it also raised questions about the dynamics of their relationship and the lengths Suge was willing to go to protect his artists. The revelation of Suge Knight taking the fall for Dr. Dre on a gun charge sent shockwaves through the hip-hop community. It challenged the perception of loyalty and highlighted the murky world of the music industry, where success and legal trouble often walk hand in hand. But why did Suge Knight make this sacrifice? What were the consequences of his actions? And how did this revelation impact the legacies of both Suge Knight and Dr. Dre? 
Join us in the next section as we continue to unravel the unbelievable story of how Suge Knight took the fall for Dr. Dre. For Suge Knight, the consequences were immediate and severe. He found himself facing a lengthy legal battle with the gun charge hanging over his head. The arrest marked a turning point in his career as death row records began to crumble under the weight of legal troubles and internal conflicts. As for Dr. Dre, he continued to rise in the music industry, seemingly unaffected by the events that transpired. His solo career took off, and he became one of the most influential figures in hip-hop. But behind the scenes, the knowledge of Suge Knight's sacrifice loomed large. The impact on their legacies was undeniable. Suge Knight, once seen as a powerful and intimidating figure, now had a tarnished reputation. His decision to take the fall for Dre raised questions about his motives and the true nature of their relationship. Some saw it as an act of selflessness, while others viewed it as a calculated move to maintain control over Dre and Death Row records. Dr. Dre, on the other hand, faced a different kind of scrutiny. While he continued to enjoy success and accolades, there were whispers in the industry about his involvement in the events that led to Shug's arrest. The shadow of Shug Knight's sacrifice followed him, casting doubt on his character and integrity. But despite the controversy, both Shug Knight and Dr. Dre left an indelible mark on the music industry. Their contributions to hip-hop cannot be denied. Shug's role in building Death Row Records and Dre's groundbreaking production work shaped the sound of an era, from out of Compton to jail. Dr. Dre, a founding member of NWA, had a falling out with Knight in the 1990s. The exact reasons for their rift are still shrouded in mystery, but it is believed to have been a combination of creative differences and personal conflicts. Dr. Dre eventually left Death Row Records, the label co-founded by Knight, and went on to achieve immense success as a solo artist and producer. Knight, on the other hand, faced numerous legal troubles and financial challenges. Despite these setbacks, he remained a prominent figure in the music industry, with his name synonymous with the gangster rap movement. His reputation for violence and intimidation only added to his mystique. As the filming of Straight Outta Compton progressed, tensions between Knight and the production team began to rise. Knight's desire to be involved in the movie to have his story told clashed with the concerns of the filmmakers. They wanted to focus on the artistic integrity of the project and avoid any distractions or controversies that Knight's presence might bring. A source close to the filmmaking process revealed that security turned Knight away from the set, citing Dr. Dre's restraining order as the reason. The source emphasized that the production team wanted to create a drama-free environment and allow the actors and crew to work in peace. They didn't want no drama around the movie set, the source said. Let them people make their movie in peace. The decision to exclude Knight from the set would prove to have far-reaching consequences, leading to a series of events that would shock the world and forever change the lives of those involved. The incident that unfolded was anything but peaceful. Terry Carter, a record label owner in Compton, and an interlocutor was dead. Suge Knight, the man at the center of the storm, was facing 30 years in jail for murder. His longtime lawyer insisted that everything was an accident, but the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department was reviewing video evidence and interviewing witnesses to determine the truth. According to an onset source, who spoke on the condition of anonymity due to the ongoing police investigation, Knight was in the midst of being attacked by a third man in a hamburger joint parking lot. Weakened and unable to fight back, Knight made a desperate attempt to flee the scene, inadvertently hitting his aggressor and tragically running over his friend Terry Carter in the process. The source provided a chilling account of the incident, offering the most detailed public explanation yet. As Terry was coming up in the lot, Knight's car struck him, knocking him down, and the tire rolled over his head. The scene was chaotic and filled with confusion, leaving those present grappling with the shock and horror of what had just transpired. Following the filming of the commercial at the historic barbershop Holiday Styles, The Straight, Outta Compton crew broke for lunch on Thursday afternoon and headed back to their trailers on Compton's east side. It was there that Knight pulled up in his red Ford F-150 Raptor, a powerful vehicle with off-road tires that sat high off the ground. CLE Bone Sloan, an actor known for his role in the movie Training Day and an affiliate of the Bloods Gang, was working as site security and a location scout assistant. According to the anonymous sources, Sloan and Knight had a history of animosity, and Sloan took issue with Knight's presence on the premises. A verbal altercation ensued, escalating the tension between the two men. Shug Knight, known for his imposing stature and larger-than-life persona, had never gotten out of his car during the altercation. He had spoken to Ice Cube security, indicating that they could discuss the matter later. However, Bone Sloan approached Knight, insisting that he should leave the area. Knight responded, I'm already leaving. The altercation continued, fueling the growing hostility between the two men. As the situation intensified, Knight called Terry Carter, a trusted friend who had a relationship with Ice Cube. Carter, a record label owner and co-executive producer on the soundtrack for The Players Club, 
had become a peacemaker of sorts, attempting to facilitate a reconciliation between Knight and Dr. Dre. He believed that bringing the two former collaborators together could not only increase his own profile, but also make a new kind of history. Later, Knight pulled up next to Carter's Dodge Magnum, just outside the parking lot on 142nd Street. The two began talking through their car windows, engaging in a seemingly cordial conversation. It was a moment that could have been a Don and Peacemaker coming together to resolve the conflict. However, the peace was shattered when Bone Sloan arrived on the scene. According to the on-set source, Sloan hopped over a short wall surrounding the parking lot and began punching Knight through the window of his truck. Knight, unable to defend himself, drove a few feet away into the entry lane for Tam's parking lot and put the truck into park. The situation quickly escalated as Sloan continued his assault on Knight. The source described the scene, stating that Sloan ran up to Knight's truck again and continued punching him. This moment appears to align with the initial police report, which stated that the argument escalated once again. In a desperate attempt to protect himself, Knight put his truck in reverse, striking Sloan and knocking him to the ground. Amidst the chaos, an associate of Sloan's arrived on the scene and began making his way toward the rear of Knight's truck. It was at this critical moment that Knight, fearing for his safety, put his vehicle into drive and tragically ran over Sloan. While Sloan was hospitalized, his injuries were not life-threatening. Meanwhile, Terry Carter had exited his Dodge and entered the parking lot. The on-set source could only speculate on Carter's intentions, stating, I guess he was trying to help Suge. I don't know what was on his mind. In the blink of an eye, tragedy struck as Knight attempted to flee the scene. He hit Carter with the right front fender of his truck, ultimately causing his death. Knight's attorney, James Blatt, maintained that his client was unaware he had hit the men. He insisted that video evidence would prove the incident to be an accident, a defensive driving maneuver after being attacked by four men. However, Lieutenant John Carina of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department found this explanation difficult to believe, especially since there was no evidence of additional attackers. The jury sided with the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department and handed Suge a 28-year sentence. That brings us to the end of this video. For more videos like this, click on the cards on your screen.